breaking news. All at your fingertips. Who's found out Samoa Gian? From people with the promise of securing government appointment for them. All right, so we're still staying on this very story. Let's go to the touch screen and see persons within the NPP government who have been affected by this very directive of the party's council. That's NPP ministers and persons who played that dual will of MPP ministers and party officials. So quickly, uh, let's quickly run through some of them. And there we have it, the very, very, very first person, that's Otiko Ofisa Jaba. She's the gender minister and national women's organizer of the party. John Peter Amewu, Lance and national resources minister. Uh, that's the Volta Regional Chairman of the Party, Dr. Archibald Lecha, Volta Regional Minister and First Chairman, that's the first Vice Chairman of the NPP. And shortly we will be speaking to that's um, Dr. Eric Odosai, who is the Dean of Graduate Studies at the Institute of Local Government Studies. And he's joined me via phone. Good afternoon, Doc, and thanks for agreeing to speak with us. Good afternoon. Now, how efficient will the ministers of state who double as office holders of respective parties um, be carrying, that's carrying out their mandate for the country? Does it work in any way? It works, and it is good governance practice for them to properly separate the activities of the mm. political party from that of the government. You know, once you, are, you become a government, you represent the whole nation. So it is better... You, you distinguish yourself as a national officer than being a party officer. So, for instance, if you are a national women's organizer of a political party and you also double as a minister responsible for gender, if you are not very careful, a section of the population may think that you are a minister for the women in NPP. Mm. But then if mm. you resign as the NPP women's organizer and you come out as a minister responsible for uh, uh, gender, uh, ch children and social protection. People see you in the national character than in the party character. So it is good governance practice, it is good political governance practice, and it is mm. very good segregation for uh, democracy in Ghana. Now, Doc, what should be the lay down rules in fighting conflict of interest when it comes to party matters and in governance as a whole? There are two things. I mean, the political parties themselves should develop code of ethics for its own members and its own leaders. That mm. is an internal matter. The government would also have to develop code of ethics for its functionaries so, so that you, may, you will not be able to see some of these conflicts of interest issues happening. What I see happening is that the parties themselves have been appropriately documented best practices and issues of conflict of interest mm -hmm. when some of its functionaries goes into government. That's where the challenge is. So they need to document it and come up with good code of ethics to guide the behaviors of these people. All right, well, thank you very much. I have been speaking to Dr. Eric Odosa, who is the Dean of Graduate Studies at the Institute of Local Government Studies. And we're looking at matters that have arisen in the MPP party and government so far. But let's move on to some more persons who have been affected as ministers and persons who play dual role within the NPP government and party as well. And um, I quickly run through some of them here. We have Carmina Duncan, who's a central regional minister, and he also is the central regional secretary. We have the Bonafu regional minister, who also doubles as the Bonafu regional chairman, Greater Accra regional minister, who is also the Greater Accra chairman of the NPP. So these are some of the persons that have been affected or will be affected by the new directive of the NPP. You still watching Media Live. Let's move on to other stories. And Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, has called for economic cooperation among African countries to foster growth and development. He was speaking during a Ketsi call on him by Egypt's foreign minister. Ghana-Egypt bilateral relations date back to the period of national liberation across the African continent in the 1950s. The visit to Ghana is part of Cairo's effort to strengthen ties with countries on the African continent. 
Speaker of Parliament, Professor Michael Quay, who received the delegation led by Egypt's Foreign Minister, Sami Shokri, noted, Africa is faced with several economic challenges, hence the need for countries to be more open to other economic opportunities. This is a time when Africa is seeking closer cooperation in economic terms so that the more specialization in terms of industry and in terms of economic um, um, development. Egypt Foreign Minister Sami Shoukri acknowledged that the six years of political turbulence and transition in Egypt have brought to the fore the need to foster continuous ties with other African countries. Yeah, Egypt uh, has in the past fulfilled its responsibilities uh, towards African solidarity and looks forward in uh, this era of its also transition to a, a new system of government and enhance the level of our uh, development together. According to the foreign minister, Egypt has about $1 billion investment in Ghana. These are in the areas of infrastructure, construction and power. Member of Parliament for Kaikui Central, Patrick Buama, called for collaboration between the two countries to further improve the aviation and health sectors. Uh, Eurojet is an Egyptian company that is building about nine hospitals. It encountered a lot of challenges. Most of the districts that these hospitals were to have been set up uh, have not benefited from that project since 2008. With your knowledge in these areas, you'll be able to assist the company if they have any challenges. This is a story we've also been following closely. And students of the Ghana School of Serving and Mapping have threatened to picket at the Flagstaff House if President Okufuado does not step in to ensure the school is reopened. Meanwhile, the Land and Natural Resources Minister John Peter Amewaz assures students of the school it will be reopened after investigations into the vandalism caused by students is concluded. The sector minister ordered its closure following agitations over the school land. May 2, some students of the Ghana School of Surveying and Mapping School went on a rampage following claims that the school's land has been sold for the construction of a shopping mall. The students allegedly destroyed property belonging to the contractor working on the land as well as that of the Lands Commission. This has compelled the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, John Peter Mewu, to order the closure of the school. As a sector minister, I totally condemn the students' behavior and actions and accordingly authorize that the Ghana School of Survey and Mapping be closed down indefinitely with an immediate effect. He also directed the students to vacate the school premises and the hostel facilities with immediate effect. Reacting to the closure, the president of the Students' Representative Council, SRC, Bright Josephine Sia, said, the students would protest if the decision is not reversed. They demand an immediate intervention from the presidency. To us, uh, we believe it is of no justification for you to go to that mark of closing the school down. We wanted to follow the normal procedure. We have done that and uh, it looks as if uh, it's not yielding any results. Uh, we would want to uh, mass up and march to Flasaf House to the first gentleman of, of the land to, you know, uh, let him know the concerns and the problems that are confronting the ordinary students on this campus. Meanwhile, the minister has indicated the school will be reopened after investigations into the incident are completed. Now, apart from issues uh, with the land on which the school is situated, the school's accreditation has also expired. Let's go on the phone lines and speak uh, with Kwame Date, who is Executive Secretary of the National Accreditation Board. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks for your time. Hello. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks for your time. Good afternoon. Can you confirm if the school's accreditation is indeed expired and for how long? Well, uh, they, they were granted accreditation on tw the 22nd of September 2005 for three years. And so it expired in 2008, September. And uh, what has the accreditation board been doing about this? 
looking at the number of years. We reminded them about the expiry before it expired. Mm -hmm. Then they have to take steps to have, the, have it renewed. We cannot do anything about them. Now, the question is that uh, can schools operate without accreditation like we've seen um, with this very situation, although you mentioned that you reminded them about the expiration of, of their license? The school belongs to a ministry as a minister of uh, land and natural resources, I believe. And uh, if they come for accreditation, that accreditation expires. We cannot do anything about them. We will just inform them and inform the public that they don't have accreditation. So are you saying that, if I got you right, is it right to say in the first place that because it's under a ministry, if their accreditation has expired, it should, we should let it be? Is that right well, to say? They, they existed before they came for accreditation. And it was a specialized institution under that ministry. If they want to upgrade their status to tertiary uh, uh, status, then they will come to us for accreditation. If they don't, no longer want to be of tertiary status, we cannot uh, force them against their will. Because if it were a case of a private school, it would have been a big national issue. I hope you understand what I'm saying clearly. I'm saying that it was a specialized institution under that ministry. Because they wanted to be tertiary, they mm. came for accreditation. If they do no, they no longer want to be of tertiary status, that will not close down the school. They can still operate under the ministry, but not as a tertiary education institution. So, if I get you right, so in which context are they operating now, knowing that their um, accreditation is expired? You have to ask the school. Not you have no answer to that? No, not me. They, I, I've told you that the accreditation has filed. Recently, they have taken steps, uh, uh, the uh, initiated steps to commence the process. And we are, we are in the process. Mm. We haven't finished. Yeah. And how soon will that be completed, the process, I mean? A lot of them will depend on them because we will tell you what to do. Go through A, B, C, and D. If you don't go through... We don't give you accreditation. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I have been speaking with um, the executive director of, the executive secretary, I should say, of the National Accreditation Board, Kwame Date. Now, let's move on to other stories shortly, and we're heading to the Shanti region, where the Busumifroho district is among few district assemblies in the Shanti region, yet to confirm nominees for the position of chief executives. Now, the president's nominee for the area, Yawa Senso, who has been opposed by some party executives in the constituency, will have his fate decided by some 30 assembly members today. Internal wranglings within the NPP and the Busume constituency is not new to local politics. My colleague William Evans Inkum joins us live from the capital to give us some updates on what exactly is happening, measures that have been put in place and the decisions that have been taken so far. So there you see some, um, I'm sure, members of um, the assembly who are getting ready. We're told that it has started and it's in place. So William Evans Inkum will join us shortly with the update. Okay, so we are coming to you live from the uh, Bosome Frenhon District Assembly. Um, this is where over 30 members of the Assembly are currently meeting to uh, confirm the president confirm the president nominee, Yawa Senso. So far in the Ashanti region, we have a total of 30 assemblies. I'm talking about metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies. And out of the figure, um, a total of 23 have had uh, via or have gone through the process successfully. So we are only having seven 
district assemblies who are yet to complete the process or who are yet to satisfy section 20 of the local government act 936 i, I will be speaking to uh, a couple of the assembly members to find out from them how ready they are as far as this particular exercise is concerned but when you're talking about bosome Frank, it has a history uh, we're talking about the political history of this particular constituency it's quite interesting uh, because um, they're sometimes it's surrounded by a number of litigation. I mean, we starting from the member of parliament from this area. Remember way back in 2004, there was a bit of litigation between the then member of parliament of this particular constituency, Honorable uh, Nanayao Akurugu, and then a, a section of the uh, executive members. I mean, it's also replicated in 2016 elections. Uh, I'm talking to, to, in 2004 election day, the man was forced to or compelled to um, go solo or, in the, or, I mean, contest as an independent candidate, which he won, of course. And then in 2008, he also uh, contested as an independent candidate. But uh, so there's a number of uh, issues when it comes to the political uh, dynamics as far as the ruling party is concerned and as far as this particular constituency is concerned. But let me speak to the presiding member for this particular district. Um, sir, thanks so much uh, for speaking to TB3. I, I know this one is very important to you because uh, it will define uh, the, 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 the district, talking about development and all that. Currently, you are lagging behind uh, when it comes to developmental projects in this particular area, roads and other things. You need a district chief executive to ensure that projects come to this particular district. Are you sure that you're going to have one today? Thank you very much. But I just want to tell you, I want to change my tongue, if okay. it can help us. district chief executive. Sure. Mm. Let me say, and say I'm more this exercise on a number of issues and I surround this particular exercise. Maybe more opposed to the president nominee at this time. No, would you do say any panel in animal? Yeah, I didn't say or more better massively. I'm a more confirm president nominee. Oh, the American is a honorable members. Nina, I will have no more now. Yami and no cranny. District in a county and a year before. Oh, yeah, was made for one district here. A district here is now. You see, I'm in your yard. You want to say DC position a place occupied by one person into no never break. But now, no, a no one in a casa mentia. See, I a juma way in tema problem being my decision. I bet to a banner and ne a bet to a banner and you DC. Sure now. Issues are never a far the qualification of uh, this particular uh, nominee and government no elected here or a sense. So, um, a debena as a sound from time and executives new be as original up to this time. Please come again. Let okay. me please me busa say a debena as a sign is now and crop for a can be 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 about the president nominee here or a sense. So, up to this time around, no, so that is why it's your down so your down so a dinner as a sign. The no man for can the no margin chero or more any woman dear the de no moon and an all can be be answer sign the tier no an tier eh and I'm din kakan yenya a yin on a dear and ke kaka kaka kra ebeba. But na be be bonny be ni a district mo ah and nena be be answer sign be be answer sign you people are going to vote massively. We are sure say mobe confirm on ama be be out to the development of a chromoha. Nyami and me hundred per cent in na me me she me members no well send a bay hundred per cent here, Juma. That's a PM. All right, so we have been speaking to the presiding member um, for uh, the Bosome uh, Frenho District Assembly, and um, he is cocksure that um, they are going to have a very smooth exercise. A total of 30 members are voting to confirm the president nominee. As I told you early on, and um, this particular district is among the seven um, still yet or who are yet to uh, get or vote to confirm or otherwise the president nominees as far as the district assemblies in the Ashanti region is concerned.
from Bosome Frehon District Assembly for TV3 News, William Evans Inkum. Over to you, studios. Thank you very much indeed, William Evans Inkum, for that update from the Ashanti region. But let's move back here and we focus it on Tema. Armed policemen have been deployed to the Tema Newtown Police Station after residents vandalized and destroyed a police vehicle at the station. Our residents' action was as a result of gunning of a 30-year-old docker by the police patrol team. Meanwhile, the Tema police commanders launched an investigation into the shooting incident. A day after the shooting incident, police officers have been deployed to guard the police station. This follows the vandalization of the station by angry residents who damaged a police vehicle on Tuesday. A 30-year-old docker was shot dead by the police during patrolling duties. According to the police, they received a distress call. The complainant reportedly told the police patrol team that he had parked his car to buy something only to return to find another person in the driving seat. The complainant's attempt to question the intruder generated into a confrontation. The police said the car owner, on realizing that he could not handle the issue, called the patrol team. The suspect, on seeing the police, took to the heels but were pursued by the policemen and apprehended. The police said in an attempt to handcuff the suspect, he allegedly snatched the rifle of the policeman and in the process of taking the rifle back, another policeman who was with the team shot him. That means I am fair. Now, they quickly rise, we call for him and reinforcement. They came and then we took him to the hospital, but he was pronounced dead. The regional command has commenced investigation into this incident. Away from that story, construction of an onion factory is expected to begin at Bazwa in the Bindu district of the Upper East region under the One District, One Factory policy. Now, the factory, when completed, will reduce onion rots and also increase production in the three regions of the north. A report by Tanko Mohamed Rabiu. The Upper East region produces 85% of the total onion production in Ghana. The onion market is growing at an estimated 11% per annum, indicating that onion production, if sustained, will continue to deliver good value to the smallholder farmers involved in its production. Industrial activity in the northern region is generally low, with only one industry in operation at the moment. The onion factory, which will be built in Bazoa, will sit on 15 acres of land. This farmer, who has been farming vegetables for the past 20 years, says there is no ready market for the onions. He is, however, optimistic the onion factory, when completed, will increase productivity. Chief Executive Officer of Northern Industrial Onion Processing Company, Alex Avoka, is hopeful the onion factory will serve as job opportunity for the people in the area. He added there is a need for value addition in order to increase income. Let's now move to the eastern region where access to portable water has improved as a quote in the Suhum municipality. The restoration mission international and NGOs provided a mechanized borehole at a cost of 4,000 cities to augment the only borehole currently existing in the town. An estimated 1,000 residents of Akote in Pabao and Yisikrum for 20 years depended on a single borehole. The inhabitants, including school children, spent long hours in search of water. Others relied on the stream about six kilometers away. <laughs> I'm happy we have water now because we've been through a lot without water. We didn't complain to him, but they felt we needed help and came to our aid. Papa, 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 Papa,
Restoration Mission International, a non-governmental organization, came to the rescue with a mechanized borehole, which would provide about 600 gallons of water daily. The students, the pupils here, when it is time for school, they go about combing and looking for water. And so I felt that I could put this uh, system here to help them. The Odikro of Akote, Bafo, or Trefo Kwapong appealed to government to construct a market on a past of land earmarked for the project. Away from that story, the executive director of the Institute of Africa Media Monitoring Intelligence and Advocacy, my son Maubi, has condemned an ethical reportage by the media on suicide cases and other related news. He noted the media failed up to 90% in reporting suicide cases in the country. The 16th guideline of the GJA Code of Ethics states that a journalist does not intrude into anybody's private life, grieve or distress until justified by an overriding consideration of public interest. This unfortunately has not always been respected, especially in cases where suicide victims are found in public places. During the recent suicide cases, some media houses reported with graphical content of crime scenes which were contrary to the GJA Code of Ethics. The executive director of the Institute of Africa Media Monitoring Intelligence and Advocacy, Misan Mugabe, says this pattern is denting Ghana's image. The media needs to be very sensitive to the victim because the victim has a human rights. The media in suicide news reporting is also supposed to make reference to experts' opinion. The media hasn't got that expertise to affirm the cause of death. At a press conference to sensitize the media on best ways for reporting suicide cases, the president of the Ghana Journalists Association, Dr. Roland Afromoni, challenged the media to practice discipline in the discharge of their duties to prevent dire implications. Our coverage of suicide stories is ethically bankrupt, culturally insensitive, and professionally unacceptable. It's an urge to all journalists to prioritize ethical discipline. Ethics should be part of us, otherwise we are in journalism by accident. On the issue of anonymous sources of unethical content from social media, the chairman of the National Media Commission, Nana Kwesi Jana Penton, encouraged the media to always cross-check information before publishing. When you churn something out on social media and you are using it, you as the journalist, your responsibility is to be aware that every source that you put on, you must double check. And I'll hand over the microphone to you on what you're seeing again. Today we're looking at the MPP's National Council decision. The National Council of the New Patriotic Party has asked all party executives who hold positions in government to resign from their party position with immediate effect. This order comes on the back of the recent clash between the Northern Regional Chairman of the party and the National Women Organizer of the party, who is also <coughs> the Minister for Gender, Children and Social Protection. What do you think? It's the best because it will help separate the like the interest you have in the party and that of the country when you are called into a ministerial position you are called to serve the nation and when you are a party executive your allegiance is to the party although the party is at long last they want to serve the nation but it, there should be that kind of separation so that their duties don't conflict it's not good to combine the both duties, the party duties, you have to do your party duties, and as for national duties, you have to have to have somebody who can do it. The national party, I think, it's a good idea. Before the nation can move on, it should be like that. When somebody is having a party position and the same time a government position, it's going to fight for the party because when the party loses, it's going home. But when you're not a, a member of the like the party, and they give you a national position you make sure you have to deliver 
your best for the country to move on. Yeah, and they also the two now would I I I I I the whole nation. It's in party there, and I I party, and I I just beat this association. It's in I bind the amount there, and then I just say we are here to do our job. We do the whole nation. We the whole nation. It will help the national activities also. If you are put in the national office to work, you have the free mind, no strings attached. And if you are still holding the party position, your people will hook, hook you. They will hook you. And you will not be free to do the national assignment. You still watch your media live. We have more. Are you an entrepreneur with a great business idea? Being on top of the news has never been easy. Visit us at www.3news.com for all your reliable news. 3 News, news at your fingertips. Everything you need to know. Captivating. Reliable. Sent Mahama, who addressed a deborah of chiefs and people of credible and breaking news. All at your fingertips. Who's found Asamoa Gyan? Super finish! Being on top of the news has never been easy. Visit us at www.3news.com for all your reliable news. 3 News. News at your fingertips. Everything you need to know. Captivating. Reliable. And Mahama, who addressed a deborah of chiefs and people of credible and breaking news. All at your fingertips. Who's found Asamoa Gyan? Being on top of the news has never been easy. Visit us at www.3news.com for all your reliable news. 3 News, news at your fingertips. Everything you need to know. Captivating. Reliable. And Mahama, who addressed a deborah of chiefs and people of credible and breaking news. The business segment is brought to you by. So watch Media Live. Time now for business. And the Millennium Development Authority, MIDA, has inaugurated a seven-member stakeholders committee tasked to ensure continuous engagement during the implementation of the Compact 2 program. The committee is expected to review at the request of the board specific reports, proposals, arrangements and documents related to the ECG private sector participation agreement. The seven-member committee, which will deal with the ECG private sector participation, PSP activity has members drawn from government, private sector, and civil society organizations. The board chair of MIDA, Professor Ya Intiamwa Beidu, charged the committee to work diligently and always seek the best interest of Ghanaians. We are all here to seek the best interest of the people of Ghana, even if the actions we take may not be what individuals would like to see. We are here to seek what is in the best interest of the people of Ghana. 
The Minister for Energy, Boachichir Mantine Jaco, reiterated government's commitment at ensuring that the country's power sector is positioned to meet the growing needs of industry, businesses and households. While there has been some attempts to carry out these requisite transformations, the reforms being implemented under the Compact 2 program, together with government actions, hold the key to arresting permanently our country's perennial power crisis. The ECGPSP activity is one of the activities in the ECG financial and operational turnaround project within the Ghana Compact 2 program. To other business stories and government is to set up an employment coordinating council to track the number of jobs created. The council will also seek to address issues on conditions of service and decent work at workplaces. Minister of Employment and Labor Relations, Ignatius Bafuewa, gave the hint when the EU ambassador to Ghana, William Hanna, called on him. Discussions centered on job creation for the youth and how to create an accurate data on the unemployment rates in the country. Both parties underscored the need to respect the rights of workers, especially those in technical and vocational training. The sector minister reiterated government's commitment in constructing factories in all 216 districts in the country. He underscored the need for an employment coordinating council to track the number of jobs to be created. So that if we are reporting to the Ghanaian people, if we are reporting to our social partners like you, then we can boldly say that yes, within the past three months, this number of people were engaged by the public sector, by the private sector. So we have created this number of jobs. Um, we want that to be very authentic. EU Ambassador to Ghana, William Hanna, pledged support towards the setting up of the council. The private sector and the public sector would meet and say, look, you know, we need these workers and or we can predict that over the next couple of years if we're expanding setting up factories and so on we're going to need workers in this 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 and areas are are are, are they are the technical vocational center are they preparing the right people the EU ambassador challenged government and ghanaian businesses to capitalize on opportunities in the european markets jobs in the export sector and in agriculture are are, are crucial for for, for ghana so it is an opportunity, it is a new agreement, it's signed for, there's no, there's no time limit. Our government's effort towards making the country an aviation hub will receive a major boost after the completion of the new Terminal 3 at the Kotoka International Airport after the first quarter of 2018. Aviation Minister Cecilia Dapa, together with other leading industry players, toured the facility, inspected ongoing construction projects at the airport. Work on the new Terminal 3 is on schedule and expected to be 85% complete by the end of the year. The flagship project is expected to ease the pressure on the existing two terminals at KIA and will handle up to 5 million passengers annually. The total project cost for now is supposed to be around 274 million um, US dollars. Um, uh, it's expected that by the end of this year we should do 85% of the project and next year, first quarter, it should be opened. As part of efforts to position Ghana as one of the most efficient air navigation services provider in Africa, a new ANS complex is being constructed. Minister of Aviation Cecilia Dapa says government expects Ghanaians to be properly trained to man all equipment to be installed at the facility. Air navigation services, which is the ANS, can never be compromised because I don't want us to finish the building and then afterthoughts come in to say we should have done A, B or C. That will compromise the project. The high-powered delegation included officials from the Ghana Airport Company, Ghana Civil Aviation Authority and others from the Aviation Ministry. That's all for business. Next, we have sports. When the news breaks, reporters and anchors broadcast it. 
journalist will talk about the impact of this on society. But current affairs will set the agenda for policymakers to implement it. This is what we do on agenda. It's sharp, authentic and hard-hitting. My name is Deborah Kwabla. Join us as we set the agenda. Agenda now shows on Sundays at 3 p.m. only on TV3 and is supported by 3FM 92.7. After going around the country in search for the strongest man in Ghana with auditions, four main zones, the final eliminator is here. 20 athletes will compete, only 12 will make it to the main show. Let's come together at the Achimota Retail Mall to witness the start of the journey of who will name Ghana's strongest man. Date, 13th May 2017. Venue, the Achimota Retail Mall. Time. 2 p.m. sharp. Ghana's strongest, the power to do. Ghana's strongest is brought to you by Mixi Choco, Chana Hot, and supported by 3FM 92.7, Onya 95.1 FM, Connect FM in Takradi, and Akuma FM in Kumasi. My name is Johnny Hughes. I'm your regular voice on 3FM 92.7 and your unmistakable face on TV3's New Day. Mothers are the emotional backbone of every family and their boundaries and curfews make us better people. My mom is beautiful, she's incredible and adorable and she's taught me to be a functioning adult. So as we mark Mother's Day this year, make it special for your mother. If she's not around, make sure that you're saying a prayer for she who taught you how to walk and talk. And for those who have been mothering you, make sure that you make the day special. It's only one day, but make sure that every day indeed counts for them. Happy Mother's Day. TV3's Mother's Day celebration is brought to you by Royal Aroma Rice, Tasty Tom, and Rich Tomato Mix. Onga, Mama's Helping Hand. Verna, Natural Mineral Water. Mother Care from Dream Cosmetics. Sports Station shows every Monday at 9 p.m. on TV3 and is brought to you by Cowbell, Our Milk, Malta Guinness and Betway. Welcome back to Midday Live here on TV3. Thanks very much for staying with us. My name is Anako Jafre with the Sports Update. And Ghanaian Supreme Court Judge Justice Enim Yabua has been elected chairman of the FIFA Disciplinary Committee. Justice Enim was confirmed earlier today at the FIFA Congress in Bahrain after pulling 98% of the votes in May last year. He was elected member of the Adjudicatory Chamber of the FIFA Ethics Committee. Justice Enim Yabua has served on various judicial bodies in Ghana Football Association, including the Disciplinary Committee, Appeals Committee. He also served on the Appeals Committee of the Confederation of African Football. In Ghana, there are tough times if you're a Ghanaian coach. Limited opportunities, increased pressure 
and huge image problems. Plus, of course, many foreign coaches willing to take jobs locally for reduced pay. As Thierry Nyan reports, many of Ghana's ex-internationals are hoping they can fight back and begin to dominate the Ghanaian coaching scene again. It is a subject that just won't go away. Ghanaian clubs and their reliance on foreign coaches has come to the fore again this week after Kumasi Asante Kotoko turned to the Englishman Steve Pollack to rescue their slide down the table in the Ghana Premier League. Pollack is one of the five foreign coaches in the league. He has replaced a Kotoko legend from Pomansu, whose stint as acting manager did not last after the club just didn't improve in his seven games in charge. At Great Olympics, the tension has only just died down after Tom Strand was brought in to replace Gordon Atram. The likes of Atram, C.K. Akuno, At Ashgold and Michael Osei were hoping long years at the highest level in Europe was softening the path to coaching greatness in Ghana. But that has proved tough. Akuno reckons he knows why. Ex-players who are now coaches must also behave well in that sense, you know, try to upgrade themselves in that. that I, I, I like it, but... I think they need more of uh, encouragement, more of uh, support than any other thing because it's an advantage that you've played football before and so you have a, a rough idea about how the game goes. Atram is more assertive in his views on the subject. The former PSV and Hoiven forward says ex-players are not getting a fair chance at coaching jobs simply because club owners just don't respect them enough. It's causing a lot between players and coaches since the, the board are not being faithful or respectful to the coaches. It's really bringing a big damage in the coaching career in Ghanaian football. We the ex one that we have been abroad and acquired a lot of experiences and want to bring it to the society is going astray. The club owners say they simply want someone who helps their clubs win. It might help too that a coach could help fast track a few players into foreign markets and help the clubs raise revenue. Whatever it is, until the ex-players begin to win and lay down the marker in coaching careers, they will discover openings for jobs are harder and harder to come by. In the UEFA Champions League, defending champions Real Madrid held off a spirited Atletico Madrid to set up a meeting with Juventus in next month's Champions League final in Cardiff. This is what it means. Real Madrid faced Juventus in the final of the Champions Madrid still on course to win back-to-back -back UCL trophies after winning it the last time against Atletico. No team has managed that feat in the UEFA Champions League, so if Madrid do that, they will become the first team to win the UEFA Champions League back to back. Remember, they have won it an incredible 11 times. In England, English FA chairman Greg Clark says Manchester United are within their right to pay agents multi million pounds, some as part of transfer, but believes the sport needs a debate about the issue after FIFA boss Gianni Fantino called for more transparency around transfers. World football governing body is looking into Paul Pogba's world record transfer from Juventus to Manchester United following revelations, claiming that Pogba's agent, Emilio Raiola, will earn £41 million from the deal FIFA has written to the Premier League club to seek clarification on the deal that took Pogba from Juventus to Manchester United in August 2016. It is believed it is it is believed the eighth inquiry center on who was involved in the 90 in the 89 million transfer and how much was paid to them in the europa league jose Mourinho insists he has no regrets at gambling manchester united entire season on the europa league united hold a 1-0 lead going into, to, into tonight's semi-final second leg game against Alta Vigo at Old Trafford looking to book their place in the final in Stockholm on May 24. And the Portuguese believes it is the right thing to do to get back into the UEFA Champions League. Uh, for the club, uh, it will be very important. It will be very important uh, to be again in, a, in an European final. For the club, it would be very important to fight um, for the only trophy that uh, the club never, never won before. And for this group of players, we have just a little group with um, 
European success. That's all the sports here on Midday Live. My name is Anako Jaffre. Thanks very much for watching. Always a pleasure serving you. We return on News 360 with the latest sports updates. Good afternoon. Weekends are a bit like several our days put into one for our sport loving fans. Several top matches, top level competitions, various sporting disciplines that have been spread across. It can get a bit confusing, but no more because of our new show, Warm Up. What would you do with over £200,000? You can't imagine, right? That is what your favorite footballer, Cristiano Ronaldo, earns per week. Now, let me show you this. That is one of the world's most expensive, a Cognizant, CCXR, Trivetta, Floyd Mayweather. He cruises into his gym with this. Now, would you like a tour to the baby jet? The Basilica is what it's called. Your Saturday mornings just got better. Join me, Thierry Nyan, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on TV3 and TV FM for more juicy information on your sports personalities and what they'll be doing when they're not kicking for fame and glory. Everything you need to know. Captivating. Reliable. And Mahama, who addressed a Deborah of chiefs and people of credible and breaking news. All at your fingertips. We found out Samoa Gian! Super finish! Being on top of the news has never been easy. Visit us at www.3news.com for all your reliable news. 3 News, news at your fingertips. Thanks for staying. It's still Midday Live. Next, we have international news. Secretary General Antonio Guterres said on Thursday the United Nations is seeking a further $900 million this year for Somalia where more than 6 million people need humanitarian assistance and 275,000 malnourished children are at risk of starvation. The London conference is co-hosted by the British government, the United Nations and Somalia's UN-backed federal government led by President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed, who took office in February after a Western-backed electoral process. African Union troops, supporting Somalia's own weak and dysfunctional military, have clawed back most of the country's major towns and cities from Al-Qaeda-linked Islamist group Al-Shabaab since the insurgents abandoned the capital Mogadishu in 2010. However, the militants continued to launch deadly attacks. Mired in chaos since 1991, Somalia is also suffering the effects of a severe drought that has left parts of the country on the brink of famine. South Korean President Moon Jae-in's office said Thursday he plans to send a delegation to Beijing to discuss North Korea's nuclear program and China's concerns about a U.S. missile defense system being deployed in South Korea. Moon's spokesman said the president agreed on the common goal of denuclearizing the Korean peninsula and that Moon understands China's concerns about the U.S. Terminal High Altitude Area Defense System, THAAD. South Korea has worked with the United States to develop THAAD to help protect it in case of a North Korean missile attack. Next, we have entertainment. Popular Nigerian actress and television presenter 
Michelle Odeni says she does not believe in multitasking in the entertainment industry. The Africa Magic Mo Viewers Choice 2017 nominee show host Est of a View engaging in two more crafts like acting or TV presenting can stifle creativity. She spoke exclusively to TV3 Solis Rose Quarty. I know you're asking yourself who the gorgeous woman is. She is beautiful, eloquent, and sassy. Producing. What are you doing? Acting. For all the misfortune that Adriana ever suffered, that she would lose her life to an inconsequential numbskull like you, is shocking. TV presenting. Tonight, it's Joan's eviction party, and it's going to be pumping, oh, pump, 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 pumping. She has done it all. Michelle Dede got her big break when she was handpicked to host Big Brother Nigeria in 2006. That money is getting so close, I can almost smell it. Woo! Okay, relax, relax. It's time now for us to turn our attention to our four finalists. And it's been uphill since then. The Ace TV host, however, revealed simultaneously working on different projects took a toll on her creativity. I'm on Hush. I would switch off for two weeks every quarter and then go and shoot moments where I'm myself. And then there was a lot of Amal Me that I found that was coming out as I was hosting moments. And that's not supposed to happen. Do on to the best of your ability. When you feel that you have reached a point where you're satisfied with what you've done, then try other things. She urged young people who wanted to branch out into the entertainment industry to assess their strengths and latch on to what they are good at first. And recently I spoke to some university students and they were saying, oh, you know, I'm studying accounting, but I really want to do uh, presenting, but I'm also interested in, in photography. I said, try one. If you know that you don't want to do accounting anymore, at least you have your degree, so it's, you know, it's in the bag, so to speak. Try photography first, do that up until a certain point, and then make the other one sort of like your side gig. And when you feel you're comfortable enough with one, or if you're not so passionate about it, then try the other. All right, then, it's now time for some creatives from Tilapia. I'm sure that got you laughing, but remember you can get more of that on our website, 3 newscom That'll be all for me this afternoon. I'm Wendy Lai. Thanks for watching. Do have a lovely and a blessed afternoon. Good afternoon.